Welcome to the March 2022 episode of the Family Tree Magazine podcast. I'm Lisa Louise Cook. Of course, the big news now in March of 2022 is the upcoming release of the 1950 U.S. federal census. It's on April 1st. And this episode is chock full of resources for you. Author Sonny Morton thinks that before we jump into 1950, we need to dig into the 1940s. And she's here to tell us why and how. And then in our Family History Home segment, author Lisa Lisson will take you on a tour of some unlikely sources for finding old family photographs. And in our Best Websites for Genealogy segment, we'll be talking to Stephen Morse. He's the creator of one of the most important free websites out there that's going to help you find your relatives in the 1950 census. And then we'll wrap things up with an invitation to our upcoming free webinar. It's all about the 1950 census. As always, we have a lot to cover, so let's get to it. First up is Tree Talk. Well, Rachel Christian is the social media editor at Family Tree Magazine, and she's here to tell us what's trending in the world of genealogy. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Lisa. So uh, what is on your radar this month? Well, as I'm sure most of our listeners know, the release of the 1950 census is closer every day. And so I thought I would just mention a little bit about what we're doing here at Family Tree Magazine to celebrate the census, as well as um, some other opportunities that our listeners might be interested in. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah, gosh, it's almost here. I know. It's, it's really an exciting year for genealogy. It's, it's really cool. So... As far as what we're doing here at Family Tree Magazine, um, if our listeners haven't done so already, I'd really recommend checking out our census homepage. Um, There we have a research guide to the 1950 census. We have tips and advice about how to prepare for the release so that when the records become available, you can jump right in and start researching. Um, Of course, we've got plenty of free resources and downloads. Um, So if our listeners haven't done so yet, I would recommend checking that out. We will also be hosting a free webinar with FamilySearch all about the 1950 census, and I'll leave links to that and the census research page in the show notes, of course. Yeah, we're going to have uh, Amanda Epperson from Family Tree University here a little bit later in the show. She's going to tell us all about that, because there are things that people can do to kind of get ready to make the most of it, aren't there? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. One of our recent articles was all about uh, finding your ancestors in 1940 and all the different ways that you can learn about them kind of leading up to the year 1950 because it was such a such a tumultuous time um, in American history so I know I'm I'm excited for the release of the census and I know our listeners are too. Uh, In other news another thing I wanted to mention is the National Archives genealogy series which will be all about the 1950 census this year. So if our listeners aren't aware Every year, the National Archives hosts a free genealogy fair on YouTube, and this year they're making it all about the 1950 census. So they'll have different videos go up um, in March, April, and May, all about you know what's on the census, how to research it. It's, it's specifically geared towards family historians, so I would really recommend checking that out. It's free, and I've really enjoyed um, the National Archives genealogy fairs in the past, so I will leave a link to the this year's series in the show notes as well. I really recommend our listeners check it out. Well, that's a terrific resource because they're obviously the original source of where all these records were housed. And uh, it's their release that's making all this possible. Terrific. Okay, so we've got the census homepage over at Family Tree University and the Gen Fair at the National Archives YouTube channel. Anything else on your radar these days? There is. Um, I thought since it's March and it is Irish American Heritage Month, I wanted to mention um, another really cool project that will be made available this year for genealogists, and that is the Beyond 2022 project. And what that is, is it's a digital research project with the goal to recreate the public records office um, in Ireland that was destroyed um, in a fire at the beginning of the Irish Civil War. It's, it's incredible. They're, it's an all-island but also international project, and what they're doing is, you know, from copies of records that were destroyed and transcripts and, 
and really any piece of information they can get their hands on. They are attempting to recreate the records that were lost, as well as virtually recreate the actual building. So the project will be live on June 30th of this year, which is actually the 100th anniversary of the fire that destroyed the original building, which I think is just so cool. So if any of our listeners have um, Irish in their family tree, I would really recommend checking that out. And of course, we'll have a link to the show notes for that as well. Gosh, what an amazing project. I mean, that's just fantastic. So and I'm sure a lot of folks here uh, listening will be able to want to take advantage of that beyond 2022. Okay, June of 2022. Wonderful. Oh, always a fount of information. Thank you so much, Rachel. We'll talk to you next month. Thanks, Lisa. Well, right now, all the talk and excitement is about the 1950 U.S. Census. Well, author Sonny Morton thinks that we ought to actually be focusing our attention on the 1940s, too. And she is here to tell us why. Welcome back to the show, Sonny. Thank you so much, Lisa. Yes, let's jump back to the 40s. I was thinking about this because when we research, normally we start with ourselves and we go backward in time. But in your article, which is called Life Begins at 40, it's in the March and April issue of the magazine, um, you actually suggest to get the most out of the 1950 census that we really need to kind of jump over it and go back and research the 1940s. So tell us why that's so important. Well, Lisa, like you said, we usually start and go backward in time. We start with ourselves because we know more about the present time. And so we head toward from the known to the unknown. But in this case, we're going from what we already knew in the 1940 census uh, to the 1950 census. So in that sense, we are sort of progressing forward in time. So it makes sense, especially since when that 1950 census launches, we won't necessarily be able to find them right away in a name search. We won't be exactly sure uh, where they are. So we'll need to find them. So uh, starting with what we already know about where they're going to be in 1950 and what we should expect or hope to see will really help us enrich that experience. Besides, if you're like most people that haven't looked at the 1940 census for 10 years, we were super excited about it. We spent hours poring over everybody we knew in the 1940 census. And then we sort of left it behind, right? And now we're coming up on 1950 and we're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. What did we know in 1940 already? And then what happened between 1940 and 1950? And Lisa, this is one of the easiest decades so far we've had to research because there's so much material available and there was so much going on. Exactly. You're so right that it's probably been a long time since most of us looked at the 1940 census. But I noticed in the article, you list a lot of different records from the 1940s that could really help us out, the census being a key one. Um, So tell us a little bit more about that, because I'm guessing if we went back today, even like you said, maybe 10 years after we first looked at it, we might actually spot more even than we did the first time around, because we know more about these families. You're absolutely right, Lisa. And that was the first thing that I hoped we'd talk about is that, you know, if you have been at this since the 1940 census came out, you're better at it now. So yeah, go back and spot some things. And, you know, I noticed maybe I did catch them the first time around, but maybe I forgot about them. Uh, So many of those work details in the 1940 census, were they working for a, you know, a Works Projects Administration project like the Civilian Conservation Corps or something like that? That's, that's going to show up there some of these little nuances so where they were specifically exactly what was their address where were they in 1940 who were they with that because that changes over time too as family members migrate from living with some relatives to then maybe starting their own families or living with others um so who they're with and what they're doing that goes back to that that work experience that they're having then so in 1940 they were coming out of the great depression they weren't quite out of it yet 
Like we were still struggling in 1940. So the idea that we go back and we look at that then with sort of a fresh perspective that, okay, they're coming out of it. And what they don't realize is that they just went through a hard thing, but another hard thing's coming, but at least with the war, but at least the economy is going to turn around a little bit. So you can kind of go back and look at it with fresh eyes that way, I think. I'm thinking, gosh, 1940 census, like you said, was just before so many of the young men went overseas. And then in 1950, we've got people coming back, people who didn't return, but also suburbia is booming, right? So we're going to be maybe finding more addresses. Yes, more addresses, more locales for sure. And, you know, just depending on where your relative, relatives were during this time period between 1940 and 1950, you know, did you have grandparents who were coming of age like I did? They started in 1940. My grandma was 11. My grandpa was 16. And by the end of the decade, they had met, married and had two kids. Like a lot. And he had gone to war and come back and she had entered the workforce and then come back. So, I mean, a lot happened in the 1940s for them. It sure did. And I loved how you used uh, the photographs from your grandparents throughout the article. They're just so adorable. I love it. So, okay, the 1940 census, definitely. And certainly, we don't want to assume that everybody's been doing genealogy like we have for over 10 years. So I'm guessing there would be people who this is going to be their first visit, or they um, need to go back and make sure they've got all that. What are some of the other records? Maybe these are records people haven't thought about, but they would be very valuable in the 1940s in preparation for the 1950s. So the first I'm going to mention isn't necessarily a historical record per se, but it leads you to it. I'm glad you mentioned all those cute pictures of my grandparents. It wasn't till I went back. So I went back to family memory. That's where we start so many things. What does the family still remember or know about this? Even if it's a handed on memory, what do they know? And it's not totally handed on. I have family members who were alive when the 1950 census was taken. Right. And so I, I went back and I once Once I started asking specifically about, well, what about grandma and grandpa during these 10 years? What about their, I've never seen wedding pictures for them. I've never seen. And so things occurred to me that I hadn't remembered to ask about before. And that's where I got those awesome pictures of them after they eloped and a picture of them at their brand new little homestead that they built and the little story behind that. So family memory Once you start asking real specific questions, not just, hey, can I have some pictures of grandma and grandpa or Aunt Louise or whatever, it was more, tell me, during this particular time period, how come I've never seen their wedding picture before? Oh, that's because they eloped. Oh, great. Tell me more. So family memory, (laughs) family family memory, absolutely. Um, But then moving on to kind of... It, for my relatives, yearbooks were a big deal because, like I said, they were still in high school during the 1940s. So I was able to find some great pictures of them in high school and learn more about them. Um, but also vital records were important because kids started to be born. They got married. Um, so in, if you think about the 1940s in general, I would say that a couple of the most important vital record types that we don't really think about a lot are going to be delayed birth registrations, because this is a time period, I've been doing a lot of really fun research on this. So this is a time period when people had started filling out delayed birth registration forms in the late 1930s if they were starting to apply for social security benefits. But beginning in the early 1940s, they were filling them out so they could either go to war or they could work in a war-related industry. They needed either proof of their birth time to be eligible for enlistment, or they needed proof of their citizenship status in order to be able to work in the military-related industries. So they had to prove that. So a lot of millions and millions of people had to apply for delayed birth registrations in the 1940s. So that's something that even if you think you already have a pretty good handle on when someone was born, if they were alive and an adult during that time period, that's worth looking for. And I think so are divorce records. Yes, the marriage record marriage rate went up real high when the servicemen came home and they started families. But uh, some of those decisions were later regretted because they were done and 
in dramatic times and after things settled down, it yes. wasn't necessarily the best choice and they weren't quite ready for that. So you also have some divorce records to go look through. And so that could be 40s, late 40s, early 50s, into the 50s. So there are some supporting record types there that sometimes we don't dig as deeply into. That's a great point. And, and I noticed you mentioned uh, newspapers as well. And I was thinking about uh, how we look for addresses. I think it's so interesting to search for addresses in newspapers. Sometimes I find things, even when the people aren't named, you actually find out what's happening. There's uh, properties for sale or other things. Do you think that the newspapers are well worth digging into before we get into 1950? I do. I absolutely think that newspapers during the 1940s are worth digging into. Sometimes it can be a little tricky because a lot of our online newspaper databases don't go past the 1920s or so because of copyright issues. So you really have to look sometimes for the subscription databases instead of the free ones, the subscription databases that will give you more robust access to the 1940s, 1950s. But there's also the good old fashioned newspaper research strategies that I've heard you teach about lots of times where you just go figure (laughs) out what newspapers there were there uh, at the time through using Chronicling America's newspaper directory, figure out what newspapers were available, and then go track them down in microfilm form or in print form wherever you can find them. In my case, I showed, I, I found a real niche newspaper. Well, I didn't find it. My mom found it. Let me give credit where it's due. But she shared it with me. <laughs> and this was from um, this was from the uh, the place where he worked had a little newspaper like newsletters. So some of those little niche papers. So maybe a community, a smaller community, an ethnic paper. Uh, there might be different kinds of papers that you'll come across rather than just the daily newspaper that we might think of during that time period. I have some of the old newsletters, I guess they were like a magazine that the Richmond shipyards out in California uh, published, and both my grandparents were working there, helping with the building of the ships. So uh, those those are kind of neat, too. Wow, so many great ideas. And this article is chock full of even more. And, and you're already getting the impression, probably listening to Sunny talk about this, that really, not only are we preparing for the 1950 census, but we're really just getting such a richer um, version of the story of our family that maybe we haven't picked it all up. And this is our chance. Um, the article, again, is Life Begins at 40. And it is in the March, April 2022 issue of Family Tree Magazine. Sunny Morton, always great to talk to you. Thank you so much for sharing all your wonderful ideas. Thanks for having me. Today's episode is sponsored by Newspapers.com, home to more than half a billion digitized newspaper pages from the U.S., U.K., Canada, and beyond, dating back to the 1690s. Discovering stories from your family's past is easier than ever in the largest online newspaper archive. Search newspapers.com for birth announcements, marriage announcements, and obituaries. Then take it a step further. Did your grandfather fight in the war? Maybe he grew prize-winning vegetables. See what local newspapers had to say about events your ancestors experienced, whether big or small. Once you've discovered your family's stories, newspapers.com makes it easy to save and share them, preserving your ancestors' legacy for generations to come. Let newspapers.com help you find the connections that link your family's past to your present. Watch together as your ancestors' lives unfold in the pages of a newspaper. Visit newspapers.com and get started today. That's newspapers.com. The 1950 U.S. federal census is going to be released on April 1st of 2022. And getting the records fully indexed and therefore searchable is going to take a little bit of time. But if you're anxious to get digging into those records, there's a couple things you need to know. And one of those is where your ancestors lived. And also you need to know the enumeration district or the ED number. Thankfully, Steve Morse has developed a terrific free online tool that's going to help you find those ED numbers and some of the extra goodies that will help you along the way. And I'm happy to say that he's here with us on the show. Hi, Steve. It's great to see you. Hi, Lisa. It's it's great to be here. 
your website, uh, stevemorse.org, I remember it's .org, not .com, is really front and center, once again, to help us with the U.S. federal census. Have you been busy with all this? Oh, yes. We're doing what we can to get ready. I'm trying to, to get the interfaces to tie into the, to the uh, actual census pages when they come online. So that's, that's been a, a big activity right now. So your website is called One Step Web Pages. Why is it called that? Oh, that, that name goes back to the, the origins of the site back in 2001. Um, the first major tool that I put up on, on the site was for searching the, the Ellis Island database. That d- database had just come, come online at that time. And I was anxious to use it because there was some ancestors that I had not been able to find up until then. Uh, but when I got into it, I realized it was very difficult to use. And I saw that I could do all everything they were doing in, in one step. It took many steps on their website. And I saw I could do that in one step. So without giving it too much thought, I put up my own tool, which was called Searching the Ellis, Ellis Island Database in One Step. I didn't realize that by choosing that name, I become branded. And all tools thereafter had to have that one step in it. It became known as the One Step website. Of course, now you are applying this to the 1950, well, I say the 1950 census. You've been applying it to all the different um, census records. Tell us a little bit, just an overview, what's on the site in addition to the passenger list search and particularly around the census records. Generally speaking, what are you trying to accomplish there? Well, it's whatever it strikes my fancy. I, uh, I think there are over 300 tools. But I, I tell people just go through them, see see which ones uh, stri- which ones strike your fancy, and and use and then use them. I know nobody's going to like all three hundred tools; that's impossible. <laughs> but hopefully, that um, each person will like a certain subset of them, and all those subsets together will be the entire website. Wow, three hundred tools! I didn't even. I mean, I go there all the time. I still didn't fully realize how many there were. When 1950, you knew that was coming down the pipeline here in 2022. Um, when did you first start working on that? Well, we finished the 1940 census in 2012 when, when the, the 1940 census went online. And I just checked my, my emails. It was about a year later that we first started putting out the call for volunteers. So about 2013, <clears throat> we started fetching volunteers to do the work for the 1950 census. And that involved uh, looking at the at, at the very the cities that we were going to support. We needed to have a list of the, all the streets in that city and the EDs that each street passed through. And we we did that by looking at the ED maps and using other tools as well. So we started that about the, around uh, 2013, working with Joel Weintraub. Uh, we've had a team of about 60 volunteers over the years. Uh, they weren't all all working at once, uh, but uh, in total we had about 60 volunteers. Uh, we we set our 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 site's a little higher for 1950 than for preceding years. Preceding years, I, I forget what our criteria was, but for 1950, we wanted to get every rural area that had a population of more than 5,000, and we have succeeded in doing that. So we have all those cities indexed on the One Step website, so you can search any of those cities uh, by streets, um, giving the, the streets and the cross streets, you can get down to the enumeration district. Okay, well, let's jump into that census, because I know people are excited about it. And you've already, we've kind of mentioned enumeration districts, which are the uh, the area that was designated that a census taker could cover during about the two weeks that they had to do their enumeration. Um, how do we go about finding ED numbers using your tools? I have a tool, the tool is called Finding Enumeration Districts uh, in One Step, obviously, and it's covers both large cities and rural areas. For the large cities, use that tool and you put in the, the street, and then that will give you all the enumeration districts that that street passes through. And then you put in the cross streets, and that will narrow it down to uh, just those EDs that are common to the street and the cross street that you entered. And hopefully you can get down to one ED. Rural areas are, are different. And I, we, I used to have two separate tools, one for large cities and one for rural areas. And that was sort of cumbersome to explain to people that we had the two different tools. So I've since merged them into one tool with one user interface. And if you put down the streets and the core streets, you're using it in, in the large city mode. And there's a drop-down list of the cities in the state you select. If the city is not on that list, it means we don't have the tables for that city. So then you select other and you type in the name of the, of the city. In that case, we're going to search the ED definitions instead of the, um, the, st- the street to ED mappings. We have the ED definitions. We search those 
to see which definitions mention the name of that city. Um, and all those that mention it, we re report back. Ho hopefully there won't be too many EDs for, for a small town, and then you know where, where to search. And now how do we get these ED definitions? Well, the National Archives has microfilm, which has all the ED definitions, but you can't go searching on microfilm. So we've had our volunteers actually transcribe all the ED definitions for 1940 and 1950. Prior to 1940, I believe we found those on the web. Uh, in, in 1940, we did the, the, we transcribed all the ED definitions from the, the, the microfilm. And then NARA came to us in 1940, asking us if they could have our transcriptions. They, of course, had the microfilm, but they didn't have it transcribed. So we said, sure, absolutely. We were glad to give that to them. They haven't come to us for 1950. Um, I, I keep saying yet, but at this late date, I'm sure they're not going to. I'm sure they've done their own transcriptions. Well, and I haven't seen their transcriptions, but I'm, I'd venture to say that ours are going to be better for the following reason. Since we're using the transcriptions to search for small towns, well, we want to get as many towns in each ED as possible. More EDs than are mentioned on the microfilm. So what Joel has done with the volunteers is to go through the ED maps and see what other towns are in each ED and add that to the definitions. So I believe in that case, our ED definitions would be more robust than the ones that the National Archives is going to have on their website. Oh, it sure sounds like it. That's, a, that's an amazing undertaking to do that, but what a difference it makes. So really, the, the genealogist is really going to benefit by hopefully knowing the actual address because then they can use these cross streets and really zero in on exactly which ED that address falls within. When they find their ED number, then tell folks how that helps when the census first comes out. Well, of course, we don't have, don't have that up and running yet, but what we plan on doing is once the census does come out, you would click on the ED number that you just found, and that will take you right to the census pages. Uh, the pages aren't hosted on some other website, either on, either on, on NARA's website, the National Archives website, or Family Search's website, or the, the, the large commercial uh, website, whose name I'm not going to mention because I'm not advertising for them, but you know who I'm talking about. Now, I noticed in working with the site, there are links that do work. And that kind of takes me to some of the extras and the collateral kinds of items that might be available for people who are researching the 1950 census. Tell us a little bit about ED maps and maybe some of the other things we might be able to find. ED maps sounds like they'd be the best thing if you can get an ED map and, you know, look at the ED map and see what the ED definition is, uh, what the ED boundaries are. You know exactly what the, what the correct ED is. The problem is the maps are not that easy to use. Uh, well, for one thing, they're on the National Archives website, but it's pretty hard to get to them from the National Archives website. You have to go to the, the, the catalog on their website and then type in the correct string that will get you to the ED maps. And it's not obvious what the string would be, and you can't really navigate through them by from state to state. Uh, so what I've done uh, on the One Step website, I put up a tool to get the ED maps from NARA. Um, but you get you get to it by entering a state and then the county uh, and then probably a town within the county and entering all that information. I will then bring up the maps from NARA for that particular lo locality. Uh, yes, it's coming from NARA's website, but it's hard to get to from the NARA website. That's why you can do it in one step. Yes, <laughs> I have to. I can attest it's much easier and uh, wonderful to use. There's also the, um, and maybe this is what you were discussing before, the descriptions. Some of your links will take us to like a page from a book that's describing more specifically what area is encompassed in the ED number. Is that what you were referring to before? Yes, when I was talking about the definitions, yeah. the definitions are on microfilm. We have a tool that gets you to the microfilm definitions and another tool that gets you to the transcribed definitions. Those are the that's what our volunteers did in transcribing what's on the microfilm. So we have tools for doing both of those. Right. And there's also codes. Tell us a little bit about, I saw occupational codes. So we're going to be seeing numbers on this census record, and we're going to be wondering what this really means. Tell them how they can uh, use your site to learn more about that. Uh, there are codes that were added later by the Census Bureau uh, to group different occupations together. So they could get statistics as to how many people did various kinds of work. But you know, you know what your grandfather's occupation was. It's, it's on the census page. So the code will not add, add anything new, except for the following. Uh, what if you couldn't read uh, what was written? It was, it's legible on the original, but on the microphone copies, you might not be able to read the occupation. 
But if you knew the code, you can then look up from the code to see what kind of occupations fell into that to that code. Uh, so I have a tool that lets you decode the numbers that they, they added. See, the census taker wrote down what the person said. The Census Bureau, the clerks later added a code to put people in, in certain categories. And then the one-step tool lets you take that code and get back to what the actual occupation was. I want to encourage everybody to go to stevemorse.org because that's where you're going to find the tools that you need. Steve, it's just been such a pleasure talking with you. Thank you so much for being here on the show. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure speaking to you as well. Thank you. So you'd like to find more old family photographs. Now, it makes sense to talk to your relatives to not only see what they have, but maybe see who else they might know who has some of the old photos. So now you might get lucky with this strategy. You also might strike out. That can happen. But either way, there are more places beyond your relatives that you can look. And author Lisa Listen is here to tell us where those places are. Hi, welcome to the show, Lisa. Thank you so much, Lisa. It's nice to talk to you. Oh, it's so good to talk to you, too. And, uh, of course, we both love old family photos. And uh, mm-hmm. in your online article, it's at familytreemagazine.com, uh, the article is called Underused Sources for Family Photos. And you came up with about 12 really kind of often overlooked sources for photographs. So I'd love to jump in and have you share these sources with our listeners. So what's the first one? Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Well, the first one would be to look in family Bible or in favorite family books, because what I have found and discovered is that some of my ancestors would actually tuck in a favorite photograph inside a book that they wanted, they knew they were going to keep. So it's just something that they would kind of tuck into their Bible or tuck into their favorite book that they would read. And so sometimes I even found them used as bookmarks. So definitely, if you have any of those Um, older books that have come through the family, whether it's the Bible or just that favorite book that your ancestor loved to read, thumb through those pages and see what could be stuck within those pages. Another place that's great to look are like baby albums, wedding albums. I know that within my family, and I've talked with other researchers, you know, when a new baby is born in the family, the first thing that happens after the greeting of the baby is they pull out the old family photos and they're like, who, do, who, who does the child look like? Oh, wow, look, they are the spitting image of aunt so-and-so. And so these are, again, places where photographs can be tucked in among the pages and you, they may be formally mounted or you may just want to just thumb through and make sure they weren't stuck in a, you know, just an out-of-the-way back page somewhere. So that's a place to look. Another one of my favorite places to look would be vertical files at libraries and archives. And vertical files tend to be, I think, overlooked by many genealogy researchers. They are not typically online. You have to go to the library or to the archives to actually search, and you never quite know what you're going to find in a vertical file. Oftentimes, though, you can find genealogy notes. You can find notes from previous researchers who donated their their files to that particular repository. And so in those vertical files, you might find actual photographs. More often than not, you might find a copy of the photographs. And so that's a definitely a place you want to look and see what somebody might have and might have stuck into their notes. You never just quite know what you're going to find there, but it's a place to look. And kind of along the lines would be county histories. When you're at those county libraries or at those archives, you want to see if the county where your ancestor lived ever had or created a county history book. Now, obviously, you're going to learn about the history, but what would happen if a historical society would do these, I would see where individuals would contribute information to the book and they would have write-ups on individual families. And what was wonderful about that is it gives you some family history, but they would also include photographs if they had the photographs. And so it becomes another place and another resource for us as researchers to look for that old family photograph. I totally agree with that. You know, it's really interesting. And my husband's family... Uh, they lived in a town in Minnesota, 
And it wasn't actually a county history book. It was a town history book. So it's interesting. If you know when a town was founded, uh, if it's been mm-hmm. more than 100 years, go check to about 100 years later and see, did they publish something or even call the city offices? Because that town book was filled with pictures from his family. I was just amazed. Absolutely. They're wonderful resources for us to look at. Another thing to think about, Lisa, when we're looking for family photographs is to really think about our ancestors' individual lives. And I like to say, um, you know, our ancestors, they traveled. And for some of those who traveled, they may have needed a passport. So you want to seek out passport applications. And some of you can find some of these on the major genealogy databases, because you may very well find an actual photograph that they submitted to with their application. And as a bonus with that, because they're usually black and white photographs, the ones, at least the ones I've found, the bonus is the application typically asks for, you know, height and complexion and eye color and hair color. So you'll get a bit of a written description as well. So that's kind of a nice little um, bonus there when you look for those passport applications. Um, another place to look would be with the family friends. Now, our ancestors did not live in a bubble, as we know. They had family members living close. They had friends that they interacted with. And this became very clear to me in my own research when I realized that among the family photographs that I had, that I had fam- they were photographs of not family. They were not, they were actually friends of my great grandmother's. And so I actually have photographs of other people in the community. And so when a researcher reached out to me at one point, they said, do you know anything about my aunt so-and-so? She was a good friend of your great-grandmother's. Turns out, not only did I know about her, I had photographs of her in my own closet. So definitely seek out who, who did your ancestor hang out with and see if they might participate potentially have information or family photo, you know, a photo of your ancestor in their collection. Church histories and directories, they contain a ton of information, not only on the church itself and the history of the, of the building of that church, but of its early church members, as well as its current church members. So directories, a church directory is sort of like a, it's sort of like a school yearbook, they're not done as often, but usually every few years, um, a church might create a directory of its members. It's a way, particularly as the church grows, that they get to know each other um, and can make sure they're they're connecting with each other. But also within those directories, they often include a church history, or it could be separate. But those church histories frequently have some of those older photographs of early church members. So you want to seek those out. Typically, they can be a little tough to find. You want to check local libraries. Check the church itself if the church still exists. That would be an excellent place to, to start or that local history section of the, of the county library. And then another thing to think about as I, we think about our ancestors and their daily lives, their you know, lives in general, think about who they worked for. You know, what clubs and societies they might have been a part of because employers, clubs, societies, they took photographs. They have um, their own directories at times, but they might have a yearly photograph at an event that they had that they would keep within their records. They could have, or they may post it in the news, local newspaper. Yeah, that's a great point. Gosh, all of these are very kind of creative, a little bit outside the box as far as uh, getting beyond just the photo albums. That's eight so far. What is number nine? Number nine would be, believe it or not, the history museums. Consider reaching out to either a state level, a state history museum, a county or a town museum, because we don't often think of of a history museum as being a repository for our genealogy records, but actually it is, they are repositories. What I like to do is to reach out I typically go to the the more the local level at a, at a county or town level and let them know kind of what I'm interested in, who what families I'm interested in, maybe a time period and ask them if they have anything within their records that uh, such as photographs that I might be able to see because 
they do certainly have these you know wonderful displays, but they have a lot of things that have not been put on display at that point. So I do like to talk with the curator to see what they might have. And oftentimes if they don't if they don't have anything, they might know somebody else and refer me to another resource that I hadn't thought to look at. So I, I like to network with those curators there. I like to get into the local newspapers because Our ancestors liked to be in the newspaper. It was their social media, basically. And so it was kind of, it was an event if their photograph got into a newspaper. So definitely check out the newspapers. Um, Again, you might find the clubs, you might find, um, you know, children or school events that may have taken place and they're documenting that. So definitely you want to seek out those local newspapers. And here's a really out of the box one. Think about, a tombstone. I have found photographs actually embedded in a tombstone. And I thought this was just kind of originally just a a one-time thing, but I've actually seen these a number of times to put it in my list to make sure that I, when I'm researching in a cemetery, that I see the actual tombstone and, and I don't go just off a transcription. So if at all possible, I like to see it in person or at least get photograph of all sides of a tombstone to see and check for any identifying marks that way or you know those actual photographs it's amazing to see these that survived and then to round out our dozen um, places to look think about those commemorative civet books and let's kind of touched on this a little bit just a, a, a moment ago but Think about the town or the area where your ancestor lived. Did they celebrate a centennial or a bicentennial? Towns and counties would create books around that time period, commemorative type books that would commemorate perhaps the beginning of the town. And they would put photographs in there if they had those. And so it's a way to potentially see some of those early photographs of ancestors that we might not have thought of previously. So definitely want to check for those types of commemorative type books. Ah, uh, yes, I can attest to that. We're, we're thinking along the same lines. And boy, you've got even new ideas in here I haven't considered. So we had 12. We had one, family Bibles and books. Two, baby and wedding albums. Three, vertical files at libraries and archives. Four, county histories. Five, passport applications. I've sound, found some there. Uh, six, talk to the family friends. Seven, church histories and directories. Eight, employers, clubs, and societies. Nine, history museums. Ten, local newspapers. Eleven, tombstones. Interesting. And now that I think about it, I have seen photos on tombstones. And twelve, these commemorative civic books. Terrific list. Uh, it's a great article. The article is uh, at familytreemagazine.com. We'll have a link in the show notes to it. And it also appears, you've got it in the March, April issue of the magazine. Lisa, a great list. Thank you for helping us breathe new life into our adventure of finding old family photographs. You are welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Well, we've come to the end of this episode, but before we leave, we're going to stop by the editor's desk. And today we're talking to Family Tree Magazine's e-learning producer, Amanda Epperson. Hi, Amanda. Hi, Lisa. How are you today? Doing great. I uh, had such a wonderful time talking to so many different folks here on the episode. Uh, but before I uh, wrap it up, I definitely wanted to stop by and talk to you because I understand that there's going to be a 1950 census webinar. Now, Rachel mentioned this. She was talking about the fact that the 1950 census is almost here. And you have an opportunity for folks to learn more about that at Family Tree University, don't you? We do indeed. Coming up on April 7th um, at 7 p.m. Eastern Time is a webinar called Don't Be Square, Discover Your Family in the 1950 Census with Jim Erickson of Family Search International. 
And during this webinar, he's going to explain different things, like why the research release of the census is so important, um, what information you can expect to find. Although if you can't wait for the, the webinar, we have a census worksheet you can download right now and look at. Um, we'll also talk about what view, how viewers can participate in the uh, reviewing of the index of the 1950 census and then you know, how to participate in that process because that enable people to access the census more easily. Yeah, and Family Search is certainly spearheading that effort. I know when we first get the census release from the National Archives around the 1st of April, it's just in its raw form. So I guess they're going to run it through artificial intelligence, and then we need people to review it and really make sure that the indexing is accurate. So uh, it's going to be a fascinating webinar just to learn more about that whole process. And it's also going to help people just take advantage of digging in there. And all right, do you have somebody you're looking for in the 1950 census that you're excited to see? You know, I've been thinking about that. Um, my parents will be in the census, which will be fun. And my one, um, great, great, my great parent, two great grandparents will be in there. So that will be um, fun to see. And I have some mystery relatives I'm trying to hunt down in Hawkins County, Tennessee. Um, but I think I'll have to wait for the census <laughs> to find them there since I don't know where they, <laughs> like, I don't know who they are even. So I'm just trying to, you know, solve some mysteries in that part of my family history. And maybe the 1950 census will help. But um, for my other ancestors, I have to look for them in the enumeration districts first if I want to like find them on April 3rd. If not, I have to be patient and wait for the indexing to be finished. Yeah, it sure helps if we have a an actual street address. But if not, the indexing, it sounds like will be done mm-hmm. faster than ever before. Anything else you want to tell us about how folks can register to participate in this upcoming webinar? So the great thing about this webinar is it will be free. Um, but you will still have to register. So you will go to our website, um, familytreemagazine.com. And on the right-hand side, there's a shop button and you would click on that. And in the download box that would appear is a link for live webinars. And you would click on that and just follow the prompts um, there. So you can get the correct links to arrive on April 7th for the webinar. Exactly. Even though you're not paying for it, you still have to, to get on the list for the link. And of course, uh, as Amanda mentioned, we'll we'll have links, uh, the link in the show notes for this episode. So that will get you to uh, the exact correct place in order to participate. Well, looking forward to it. Thank you so much. Always great to talk to you, Amanda. Yes, thanks, Lisa. Thanks for joining me for this March 2022 episode of the Family Tree Magazine podcast. Boy, oh boy, are you going to be ready for the 1950 census? Uh, I'd love to hear about the discoveries that you make. Join us over at the Family Tree Magazine Facebook page and share what you find uh, using some of the techniques and the tools that we talked about in this episode day. And of course, you can find the links to all the sites we talked about, ideas, everything's over at the show notes page. And that's at familytreemagazine.com slash podcast. And while you're there, uh, be sure to sign up for our free newsletter. That's the perfect way to stay in touch all year long. Again, I'm Lisa Louise Cook, and I invite you to visit me over at genealogygems.com, which is home of the Genealogy Gems podcast, also available through your favorite podcasting app. Until next time, have fun climbing your family tree.